road, possibly. I'm scared. Oh, he is. Okay, cool. I can't see. <laughs> there he is. Down one chair. And Recording in progress. Collectively in one spot. I'm having to go forever, too. I didn't know. Nope, no problem. No. No big deal. Kristen's coming though, right? As far as we know? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> if anybody needs wines, I recommend Bali wines. They have the best customer service I have ever experienced. Bali, where are they? Wines. <laughs> they're, I mean, they're, um, it's a big company and they retail in all kinds of different places. Probably the Shady Lady has probably. The Shady Lady has big prices. I know, that's why my mom was there. And I was worried about, well, I can't get them with Fair Lady or whatever. And nope, <laughs> I can't. Even on Subatis School, or the Curtain Subatis School. I've had mine for ten more than ten years, and I no oh, about the company. I I called to see about getting them restrung because they're the top down uh -huh. board list. I mean, um, they're, yeah, they're uh, shipping and everything for free. Oh, it's, yeah. I didn't even ask for it. I was going to pay the fifty dollars plus shipping. So I'll just do it. That's what I say. Customer service. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I'd known that eight days ago when I just bought a bunch of clients. <laughs> <laughs> well, they own it's it's Springs Window Fashion or something like that that owns all the blinds and they own a couple others. So. Yeah. Wait one more minute for. How's the uh, Valentine's dance? <laughs> hey, I think we're ready. So, uh, oh, good evening, everyone. This is the regularly scheduled meeting of the Trinidad Planning Commission for Wednesday, February 15th, 2023. Uh, as you can see, um, there are four of us here, and then our chair is elsewhere, but is here via Zoom. So uh, we've Agreed that um, I would chair the meeting this evening, but uh, Aaron, please don't hesitate to tell me what I'm doing wrong, okay? <laughs> Less, okay. <laughs> All right, the first item on our agenda is the roll call. Can we have a roll call, please? Sure, Commissioner Johnson? Here. Commissioner Slay? Here. Commissioner Colt? Here. Commissioner Hopkins? Here. And Commissioner Hickenden? Here. Thank you. Okay, the next item on our agenda is we have two um, minutes, sets of minutes for approval, December 14th, 2022 and January 18th, 2023. Um, are there any comments, question, changes? Let's start with the first set, which is um, on um, uh, the uh, January 18th at the first one in our package is the January 18th. Any comments, questions, clarifications on that one? Yeah, Aaron. Um, I have one just on the bottom of packet page three, which is page one. Uh, it says that uh, Commissioner Haken observed the ordinance lacks language limiting reasonable accommodation to primary residents. And in fact, uh, I observed that it has language in the ordinance controlling or containing 
So kind of the exact opposite was my sentiment there. And I just want to make sure that got recorded properly, if that makes sense. So perhaps the word lacks being swapped to the word contains. And I'm sorry, what page was that on again? Packet page three, the very bottom. Page one of the uh, of those minutes. Oh, you're on December. Okay. Sorry, is that not what you said we were starting on? Uh, I actually was starting on uh, January 18th, but that's okay. My, my apologies. I must have just put them in the wrong order. Yeah, uh, that's, yeah, no problem. Yeah. So let me get, get to there for just a second. Um, so I wonder if that was, maybe it was the whereas, is that, is that, or maybe it was like the purpose and the whereas as you were talking about, was it an argument against having it be the primary residence? Yeah, my concern initially when I objected or had concerns over the ordinance when it was first brought to us was that it was being limited to the primary, and that was that was my concern, not that it lacked language limiting it to the, the primary residence, that it did limit it to a primary residence. And I apologize, I skipped right over um, the December 14th. It is the first packy, uh, first uh, list of... Uh, for the first minutes in our packet. I'm sorry, I should have paid more attention. Any other comments on, let's start with December 14th. Okay, anything on the next set, which is January 18th. Do I get to be the, the guy who points out that there's a typo in the phrase Johnson pointed out typo? Uh, <laughs> that's of, uh, page nine. You, you can. <laughs> Absolutely. And then I just had a, yeah, I, sorry. Go ahead. Um, I had a, a question or commissioner discussion on uh, page two of the minutes. Um, I thought there was also, if I recall, a request to figure out for me or other commissioners down the road as we're not present once the emergency order sunsets the right way for noticing access that kind of staff since it's going to snap back to pre-covid that we were going to reach out to whoever or that you were going to reach out trevor to whoever was the right person to kind of get a ruling on that yes and so right now under the i did look at that right now under the emergency order it can all be hybrid and non soon under the new legislation, there are only specific reasons that you can be absent. And yes, there does have to be a forum in person. And then just a, a, a further clarification for me, for example, if I am via Zoom in the future under the new legislation, are there noticing and access requirements in place wherever I'm physically located so that someone could come into, as example, tonight, the fire station? Those, those have gone away yeah. with this new legislation. Yeah, that went away, yes. Okay. Thank you. Any further comments on the guidance? I, I just had also one uh, comment uh, regarding uh, an issue that was brought up. Uh, this is on packet page number nine, the third paragraph. Uh, paragraph says, it starts out with, a, there was a discussion about how to enforce removal of reasonable accommodation. And the last sentence says, she suggested a requirement for a deed restriction for added disclosure. The language was left as is with a suggestion to research the issue further. Um, do we have any further information on that or is that something you're still working on? I have not worked on that since the meeting. Yes. And does it impact the minutes per se? I just wanted to follow up to make sure that um, if there was still some action to take that we were still working it. Okay. Anything else then on any of the minutes? May I ask a procedural question? Absolutely. Will there be two motions to approve separate sets of minutes because I'd like to abstain from one and vote, I guess, in favor of the other? That's, uh... Uh, I was going to do it at one, all at once, but we can do two. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so uh, do I hear a motion to approve the December 14th, 2022 
minutes. Motion to approve the December 14th minute. Motion, second. Second. Okay, we have a motion and second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Next uh, motion is to approve the minutes of January 18, 2023. Do I hear a motion? Motion to approve uh, January 18th. We have a motion. Second. second. Move then second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. <laughs> motion. Carries so both sets of minutes are approved. Our next item on the agenda is approval of the agenda. We have four items that are here tonight for public hearing, discussion, decision, and action. Any suggested corrections, changes, or amendments to the agenda? Hearing none, uh, do I hear a motion to approve the agenda? Motion to approve tonight's agenda. Second. Move and second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The uh, agenda is approved as stated. Next item on our agenda is items from the floor. This is an opportunity for anyone from the public who would like to address the Commission on any subject other than the four agenda items which are on our agenda this evening. Um, we request that you limit your uh, comments to three minutes unless you request a specific uh, exception to that. Are there any comments from the public? Hearing or seeing none? Move on then to our next agenda item, item five, which is, as I said, the five agenda items, sorry, four agenda items that are on our agenda for discussion this evening. <laughs> First one is committee appointments. And Trevor, I'll let you tell us all about this. So there are three committees, advisory committees that have been created by the city council over the last few years. Uh, and that includes the STR Advisory Committee, uh, the Trails Advisory Committee, and the Water Advisory Committee. And all three of those committees um, have a member of the Planning Commission appointed to them. Um, and I, let's see, I believe, Tom, you are on the Trails Committee yeah. currently, and Aaron, you are currently on the Water Committee. Diane was the STR Committee appointee. Um, so at least that one needs a new appointee. Um, and if Tom and Aaron are con interested in continuing on those committees, um, that's, that's certainly, um, so I attached the resolutions um, so you can see what the purpose of the committees are. Uh, most of the committees meet orderly about, I would say. Um, the STR committee just decided to, to meet only twice a year now. Um, things have settled down, but the PhD also. Um, and then, so the, the Planning Commission will elect an appointee and then, but the official appointment is made by the City Council. Thank you. Any questions, clarifications, comments from the commissioners? Yes. Yes. No, please go ahead. I'm just uh, seeing in the resolutions that these are typically either two year terms or staggered two year terms. Are there term issues that we have to consider as we build positions that aren't technically it? We've had so much turnover on the planning commission that has not been an issue thus far. And I don't think I don't think either Tom or Aaron have been on their committees for two years. So they needed to be on those committees for two years then? Is that no, because I, I think they um, replaced someone else, so they took over a term, probably. Um, <laughs> so we have not actually addressed that issue of trying to stagger them. 
Because the water advisory committee was made later too, so that was later. So with, with, with that in mind, um, for the two commissioners, which are currently on committees, how long have you, well, I, I guess I should say, how much longer do you have for uh, the trails committee, your your current assignment to the trails committee? I think that I can know a year. <laughs> another year, okay. And Aaron, the same question to you. Yeah, Tom and I swapped those at about the same time. Um, so yeah, it's about a, a year and a few months probably. I'm sure we could find the exact date. It wasn't that long ago that we did this. Okay. So right now, um, uh, we would need uh, commissioners for a one year for two committees and a two year commitment for the third. And then I guess the next question would be, are you two still interested in serving on the current uh, committees that you're assigned to? Yeah, I am. I have much to do. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom, just so it's clear, Tom agrees that he will continue on the trails committee. Uh, Aaron, same question to you. Yeah, very much so. The water advisory committee meets generally, you know, quarterly ish and it has needed. And so, yeah, we've got a meeting coming up and I would very much like to continue the work we're doing there. Okay. And so then next question would be is, uh, for the remaining, uh, <laughs> commissioners as to, uh, of the uh, two-year commitment for the STR Advisory Committee. Uh, I'm happy to serve on the STR Advisory Committee for a two-year term. That's Chris. Well, I'm, also, I'm also happy, so uh, <laughs> I don't know. You, whichever, you, however you two want to do it. Um, I'll, I'll let Chris do it. <laughs> I will do it. Okay. And I will, uh, yes. Except the nomination to do it, if that's uh, what's happening. Yeah, actually, uh, the suggested action is just to recommend new members to the STR because they will be appointed by the city council. So, uh, so then we have an agreement. Uh, Chris will serve on the STR committee. Tom is on the trails committee, and Aaron is on the water committee. And Reed. Yep, just a, a question. Are we uh, agreeing then that Tom and I will kind of finish out our terms and then perhaps in about a year would be time to revisit and provide opportunities again? Or are we, in essence, you know what I mean? When I'm asking, where, where are we with that? Just, I'm not yeah, opposed I think, to. I think I should look into that. And maybe we might need to get clarification from the city council because normally, it, I mean, it would make sense to have it on, you know, election cycle. Um, since that's when new members typically come on. So, um, you know, if you were just taking over someone else's appointment, is it up now and you need to be reappointed? Mm -hmm. I, I, doubt it. I doubt the city council really needs to do that. Um, but maybe in your motion, just include the recommendation for all three, just in case um, they need to re redo the memberships. So you think we need a motion for this? Sure. Okay. <laughs> I, mean, I don't think you have that. Oh, I was just referring to the staff recommendation, which is to forward the recommendation to the city council. Yeah, and just vote on the recommendations. Okay. Do I hear a motion for the current suggested uh, committee assignments? Yeah. A motion that, that the three people, uh, can I do it if I'm in there? Yeah. Yeah, all right. No, no, no. And that motion that we we move along and okay. let Chris be in, in the STR. Okay. I'll second. Second. Any further discussion? Very none all people say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay. Next item on our agenda. TUSD 2021-11, review the practices and operations of the digital sign approved under this permit as required as a condition of the project approval. Yeah. So uh, this project was approved last February. Um, there was uh, a fair amount of public interest for those of you who were involved in that. Um, and a lot of people were worried about how bright it was going to be, how 
distracting it was going to be. Um, and so the planning commission included a number of, of conditions on that um, the operation of the sign and requested that a operations manual be submitted by the school district and that the issue be revisited after six months. So we passed the six month mark, we're at the year mark now. Um, the operations manual is, is in your packet. Um, the conditions also included some consistency with some other documents and information that were submitted as part of those hearings that included that information as well. And so this is just an opportunity to, you know, uh, discuss how, how it's working and whether any changes can be made for them. Um, thank you. Uh, I apologize. I forgot to ask for public comment on the last agenda item. Should have caught that. Although I, I will ask, is there any public comment related to, uh, the proposed, uh, commissioner's assignments to committees? Okay. Hearing none, we'll move on. I apologize for not uh, catching that. Okay. So moving on with this one, thank you, staff. Uh, any questions, clarifications uh, for staff from the commissioners? Okay, hearing none. Um, at this point, I will open this up for public comment. And we do have a representative from the school with us tonight. And uh, so uh, I'll certainly, if you would like to make some comments. Just here to answer any questions you have. Um, I haven't, we haven't gotten any comments from the community about the sign. I'm wondering if you guys have any concerns. We found it, it's been really beneficial to communicate with our families. And, but I'm just here if you guys have concerns or questions. Can you pick her up? Would you mind using the I'm microphone? Sorry. Do you want me to stand up there? Yeah, thank you. That way we can get it on the record. <laughs> and, and if you could just introduce yourself, I know who you are, but just uh, for the record. My name is Elise Nichols. I'm the superintendent principal at Trinidad School. And if you have any questions or concerns about the sign, I would love to address them. Thank you. Appreciate it. Any questions? I uh, just have a comment um, as a community member who does not have children or isn't really associated with the school. Uh, I would say I hardly noticed the sign, which I think is probably the intent, given that it doesn't really pertain or provide information <laughs> that pertains to me. So I think that's uh, was pulled off well. You miss, you miss next school night? I miss next <laughs> school night. Next year. So ne next year, I'll, I'll pay attention. That's good. I'm glad to hear so that it's you. not visually intrusive. Yeah, that's my opinion. I have uh, I think a series of questions for you, actually. Okay. Um, and the first is, have you received any feedback from students or families or faculty that they wish the sign had more functionality, that they feel like it's underutilized? Not yet. Um, most people are happy that we can, you know, on basketball game day, we can say, welcome to this team. Um, we weren't able, Aaron and I had talked about potentially using it to do a, a to advertise disaster services, but we realized that there's no power. <laughs> we cannot advertise disaster. Um, but I think as of now, we can adjust the sign day of to say, and it's it's really been a beneficial um, communication tool. Okay. Absolutely, sure. Um, I guess my second question would be, uh, considering some of the, the public comments, through the permitting process. Do you feel like there are any concessions that you made that um, you wish you hadn't made in retrospect? Or have you, did you hamstring yourself in any way that you regret? Potentially the amount of information we can display per day, if we could have some more display, uh, you know, advertising two to three events per day. Right now we have it static, one image per day. Um, it would be nice, but I also know that we said there would be no flickering between events. So I think if we could have more events on busy weeks, it would be nice to be able to rotate through. 
like, I mean, I, I would tend to agree with whatever, whatever that is worth. I also have my kids there, but I think that as a, as a service to your families, this community, that's probably a, a more effective way to use an electronic sign. Um, so I've got one more question, which uh, I promise is not intended to be a gotcha, right? But at the moment, um, I think for most of the day today, the sign is just the, the dragon head uh -huh. in the lower left corner of the time of day, in the lower right hand corner of the dates. Uh -huh. What percent of the time, just best guess, what percent of the time that the sign's been on has that particular display, right? display as opposed to some specific? It's yeah, just... a very good question. Um, I think it kind of varies. Like right now, we're in a spot where there's not a whole lot happening. Um, but I would say in general, we try and have some sort of event coming up. Right? That is a really good question. I mean, and yeah. here's, here's the reason I asked. It occurs to me, as I was watching today, that was the time in the lower left corner. Uh -huh. Couldn't you make the argument that it's actually updating 60 times per hour? I guess you are technically true. And uh, I would say that that is done so subtly and so inobtrusive that nobody has ever made that point before. Right. Right. So I think my opinion as, uh, as someone who's outside of the process the last time is this. Um, but it is possible, I think, because it's done sometimes 60 times per hour to switch the display in a way that is subtle and inobtrusive. Mm -hmm. And if, again, you feel like you've been hamstrung in the, in the way that the current permits you know, allows you to operate the sign, I would, and I don't know if this is ethical for me to do or not, but I would certainly invite you to you know, uh, buy or, or revisit the permit process in a way that makes that sign most beneficial to the families in town. Okay. okay. I saw from your letter, right, that it's, it's sort of the most important in the mornings is kind of dropping off kids. Yeah. And evenings when they're picking them up, or it's the afternoons. And um, it seems perfectly reasonable to me if there's been no public concern about it. That, uh, yeah, especially during those times of day, it seems reasonable to, to flash through two or three I just, I mean, if one of those messages is, is, is so innocuous as like, don't forget to bring your pencil on Monday, if one kid sees that sign, it's a pencil in the backpack, then it was worth displaying. Okay. So again, I, I don't know, uh, I don't think it's my role really, uh, again, sort of hard suggestions, but I would just say that, yeah, I feel like you could utilize more. I think that could be very beneficial uh, because there's often times that we want to have a couple messages going, but we have to kind of choose one per day. I know in the permit it said one per hour, but it's, you know, it's not really, if it changes every hour, parents won't see that. So it's just, we just do one per day. And there are, you know, there are definitely programs we can use where, you know, at Sherry Heights, when it changes, it spins and moves. And I think that is very visually distracting. But it, there's definitely ways you can just kind of fade in, yeah, fade out. Fade through black, right? Yeah. yeah. But, it's... but I know last year people were concerned that as it was right by the school, right by the crosswalk, that it would be a, it would create a distraction. But it wasn't up yet, right? Correct. I think uh, you did a really good job over this time to, to really make it fit in well, and I appreciate that. Um, I was wondering if I, I realize if the power's out and you can't use it, but is it is it available for it's for the community and if the community is best used by having a few more signs, um, I'm not opposed to that either. But if say the city needed to put a sign up, is it, are you opposed to having that up? No, I think we even put it in our in the handbook that you could work with the city yeah. to, to give information. Nice job. Um, I believe there was going to be some kind of rustic. Boundary or something that was Start working <laughs> on. <them. laughs> no pressure, it looks good. It is in process, and we're also, as we took the sign down, we realized that the exterior really needs a fresh coat of paint, so we are also working painting the exterior. Thank you. Diane's not here. How about the cherry tree? It's been pruned twice this oh. year. <laughs> 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 My wonderful husband came and did a good haircut over Christmas, and then we heard it once over the summer. Other comments? 
I did have just one suggestion, um, at least in the interim, perhaps changing it at drop off versus pickup. That way, at least you could capture two different opportunities for messaging, and that would fall well within, you know, the existing guidelines uh, and give you the chance to capture folks twice, maybe. Yeah, and it is small step. <laughs> yeah, the program is not as user friendly as we were led to believe. So it's one of those things where if we did it on a rotating basis, we would just want to say, you know, change every seven minutes or change every five minutes. It's we thought it would be much easier to program than it currently is, which is a bummer, but it's not impossible. But we could do, you know, do this one from eight to noon and do this one from noon to six. Mm. So. Uh, just just a couple of comments. Um, Obviously, when we approved this, um, we were pushing against a fair amount of public uh, comments that uh, were raised at that time. And it's good to know that you haven't received anything. I, I don't know if the city has. Um, it has not been brought up to the commission. So uh, my guess is that there, if there's been any comments, they've been of a very informal nature. Okay. It's the only thing I can say, um, but uh, admittedly, I have personally have not heard any, so that's that's really a good sign. Um, and and I don't have any problem with uh, what uh, Commissioner Slay has requested. I think it probably makes sense if you feel that there are some um, alternate ways in which to utilize the sign. I think it makes some sense for us to maybe take a look at those um, sometime in the future if everyone agrees. I mean, I. You know, we can certainly take a look at that. I don't think we're cast in stone at this point. Um, the one thing that, um, however, uh, and, and I, I do take this back, I did get one comment, and that was that while it was not a specific requirement, you had, um, when the sign was approved, the, uh, the agreement was that the sign was only going to have black letters, I'm, I'm sorry, a black background with colored text. Okay. And I think some people thought that that was just going to be black and white. Okay. And, and obviously that's not the case because there's red on there tonight. <laughs> so uh, it might, you might want to just, my suggestion personally would be if you could clarify that in your handbook okay. as to what that meant. I, I don't think there'll be any problem with that, but it's just okay. a matter of just clarifying the expectation was black and white. And certainly the way you read this, it would imply that there could be colors, but just. Are you, as a planning commission, do you feel like the use of color that we've done so far is appropriate or do you feel like it's too much? I think it's appropriate. Okay. I don't think it's too much. I like what you've done. Okay. Yeah. So I think it's been great. Okay. So I'll just say it'll have a, a background and text. I think one of the, one of, yeah. So I'm wondering, yeah, I'll figure out how to say that and just have a, a background with simple text, a static background with simple text. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I think, um... Well, I'll leave it up to you to decide how, how best to word it. But uh, my comment is that there was some expectations, they, okay. they, 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 I, but they may not have even been correct. <laughs> but I'm just saying that maybe that we clarify that in your little handbook sure. and I think we'll be in good shape. And, okay. and certainly I think we can work something out there. Um, any other comments? I, I do have uh, one more piece of feedback, which is, um, one of my concerns in general in Trinidad is the lack of access that kids have to playgrounds during um, you know, business day. There's, there's some sort of agreement, uh, the details of which are unknown to me, about you know, the public being able to access, access the playground and, uh -huh. and you know, be able to act there at least occasionally, I guess, when there's no school yeah. in session and after school programs aren't going. Yeah. So it would be nice to be looking for a way to um, improve the extent to which the sign contributes to sort of community service. It would be nice to sort of in a very subtle way, uh, the time of day that the school grounds are in use. I guess so I get why that would be. Can I? So I can. Um, 
research the history of this a little bit, uh, there was a point at which the city and the school were kind of jointly paying for the insurance, but now it's the school only carrying the insurance. And so our insurance company has told us that if we announce to the public that it's open, that creates extra liability on our part. Whereas if we just leave the gate open, it's just able to be used with a kind of an unspoken understanding. Okay. So the school closes at six o'clock, daycare ends at six, and then it, we unlock the gates and it's available for use. <laughs> so I don't know, what were you thinking just like playground open? No, I mean like it's, I'm sure I'm honestly like all this information is available someplace, right, on the, on the website or whatever, but just like it's uh, it's nice to drive by the school and think, oh, like maybe, you know, six thirty rolls around, I could take the kids over there or something. It doesn't yeah, matter, and because it's a, it's a moot point. Uh, yeah, and the gate, you know, the gate is, we leave it, during COVID we had it locked because it was COVID. And then now, as soon as, basically, as soon as the bell rings and kids are getting dismissed, the gates open. And then, but we do ask people who are from the community not to be there just as a safety precaution. But then as soon as six o'clock rolls around, it's still unlocked and begins it's unlocked. Understood. And I apologize <laughs> if I'm working on the record that shouldn't be on the record, but I was just, just curious. But it is interesting because there is an understanding in the community that it's a community park. But because we no longer have that insurance agreement, we can't call it a community park. So I know that uh, Jack West was looking at the community plan and putting that in, and I had to ask him to take it out with the understanding that it's still available, but it's just not advertised as such. So it's like there should be some changes there. <laughs> well, there is. So it's in the existing general plan um, that it um, should be. To the I think I, Jack, that's what Jack is working on. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, in the adopted general plan that was adopted in 1976, that's been, it's been in there. Yeah. Um, but there's also a state, not a state law, but there is a state policy that encourages state grounds to be open to the public. How that. And yeah, we fall in a weird thing because we're not technically state. It's, it's some schools do, they lock their playgrounds completely, but we found that people just pop the fence anyway. So we may as well encourage them to enter safely. Yeah, it'd be nice to sort of know what power your pulse. Yeah, and, yeah. And our insurance person just suggested like leave the gate open, have that understanding, but don't have it written anywhere that you're a public park after 6 p.m. So, and we can talk more about that if that's something you guys are wanting to look at. Yeah, I'll have to see what's in the existing general, I mean, in the draft general plan that we're working on. I think in there it was written that we were a park, or like a, that it is a recreational facility. Yeah. Yes, yeah, I think that's probably still, like I said, it's been in there. Yeah, and I realize we're, we're drifting too far from the agenda item at this point, but if indeed that public park, that public recreation area is closed during school hours, that means that there's basically no recreation area of that type in yeah. Canada, which is one of my big concerns and maybe something I should ask the council to look into. And with the new funding that's coming available for schools, we have to have 30 extra days of educational services throughout the summer. So that means there's 30 days of school where we're going to have school for our kids who sign up for it, but not for any visiting tourist families. So there are fewer than, even fewer opportunities for them to go on the field, on the track. In winter, there's none, right? Because it's dark outside of school. Okay, any further questions, comments? Well, thank you very much for yeah. being here this evening. Uh, appreciate your feedback. And I think I hear that we certainly would encourage you to take a look at your handbook. Okay. And, and you know, we can take a look at uh, some changes to make it a better use, useful tool for you and useful for the community as well. So what would, would you like me to resubmit the handbook 
And how would you like that to move forward? Well, uh, I'll, I'll ask staff, but we have basically completed our requirement, which was to review the handbook. Okay. Um, one could argue, though, that since we're saying that there could be some changes made that, uh, you know, it, it would come back to us. But I, I don't personally have any real finite schedule that I feel like you need to adhere to unless, Trevor, you have any reason? Yeah, I mean, maybe for the next school year might be um, and you know it might be I man looking I see um I did see a black background with colored text I think uh, that was pretty clear in there um you know, it so I can switch if you guys are okay with that I'll just say a static background with colored text and that's I mean that's fine with me and then I think you know it says no more than one message per hour I mean I think if you guys want to change that timing right now could do that and you know whether you wanted to come back to public the uh, you know, planning commission or whether just something that's kept on file with the city and if there's any complaints maybe you revisit it um, I, would, feel I would be in, oh, but there you go no i was just i'm i definitely think these are all things we need to consider and work on. I just, Trevor had the procedural question. Um, you know, we approved this permit and went through the process. Are we in essence allowed to now change the conditions of approval at this meeting right here? Does that do all the proper notices and that kind of stuff? I just don't want us to get into a situation where we had a procedural goof up down the road. If we wanted to change the timing, for example, that was one of our conditions was once per hour. Well, I mean, I think you're here now. You can change that condition now. I mean, I didn't notice all On the papers, something. but it was, I think this it went out in the public newsletter. It was on the agenda. I mean, isn't that the intention of having this agenda item is yeah. to potentially make changes should yeah. they be needed, I guess, yeah. as a follow-up? Yeah. So it's just a question of, I, I personally would like to see that come come back as part of a handbook okay. rather than do it this evening, only because it's a little, we, we can just noodle on a little bit longer. I don't necessarily think that you need to come back. Okay. <laughs> but, I mean, uh, you don't think it'll be, I just hate for there to be a question or somebody concerned. We can always handle that, you know, okay. but uh, uh, just to give everyone an opportunity to see the final version would be appropriate, I think. So uh, I think that will work out. So I'll change it. It'll say a static background with color text, and then the image can change. I think of some adjective that means simply once every, <laughs> well, I don't know, do you guys think five to seven minutes is appropriate, or? How long do you think parents are standing outside on average? <laughs> Probably like 15 minutes. Every five to seven minutes, then so they could see it. Okay. Three messages. Okay. I don't know. I don't, I'm not really speaking for the I'm speaking for the public, huh? but I'm not okay. speaking for the entire public. Well, maybe I should be. Never mind. I'm just going to stop talking. <laughs> I think that seems reasonable, a reasonable thing to report. Okay. I can make those changes, and then Trevor, I'll just reshare the document with you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much for your time. I really appreciate it. We're here for it. <laughs> okay. Um, I lost track of whether or not I had opened this up. So I will do that at this point. Oh, any okay. comment? I mean, I, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll save for public comment. <laughs> yeah. uh, if there's any uh, public comment. On this agenda item. All right, see you none. All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Okay. 
Next item on our agenda is water efficient, water efficient landscaping ordinance discussion decision regarding water efficient landscaping ordinance as required by state law and as directed by housing home and policy HI-17. This is a LEAF grant funded task. Okay. So I was originally envisioning this more like the reasonable accommodation ordinance or because of school standalone. I mean, I knew the ordinance wasn't simple, but um, just in terms of adopting a, at least the prescriptive portion of, of the ordinance. Um, but then as I dug into it, um, it's just seemed to get a little bit more complicated, overlaps with a number of other things. I mean, one of the primary ones being the city doesn't, currently regulate landscaping. And so how, how is this going to, I mean, this state law is in effect and the city has to implement it regardless. Um, but how do people even know that landscaping is subject to review? Um, we've never, we've never reviewed landscaping. Um, and that would be one reason to get it in our ordinances. But I think, yeah, it's just, it's mixed up in, how are we going to start bringing that into our permitting process? Um, you know, we do have some, uh, we do have some funding and a REAP grant to redo all of our application forms. And one of the ideas was to bring, you know, the, the stormwater into it, the landscaping into it, some of these things that are not um, clear at this point into our permitting process and create a frequently asked questions that can be on the website. So that will help. So at this point, it's really um, an, an informational item for you to start to think about and, and consider. Yeah, I think I think at a minimum we need to look at you know, getting some some requirements for landscaping plans in our in our permitting and proceed procedures. Um, you know, as I mentioned, this this the the model wello that this the state has and it's like it's, it's not really a model because it is the state law um it's so complicated and and unless you're following that prescriptive process you have to have a landscape architect i mean you can't there's no way to do for someone to do this on their own calculations that whole transformation, all this stuff, the water demand um, that has to be in it. So it's very complicated, but I don't think that we're going to get a lot of projects. You know, that's mostly for commercial type projects with lots of things. So I don't think we're going to get those kind of projects anyway, so we can stick within that prescriptive. So, you know, one thing to think about is if the city wants to regulate things any differently from the state. So. In general, you can be more, it has to be at least as effective as generally as more stream. So if you want to look at, um, you know, right now it's rehabilitated landscaping over 2,500 square feet. If you want to look at rehabilitated landscaping less than, I did see an example of the one. I also saw an ordinance that um, exempted edible landscaping, um, which I saw in the state ordinance. It's less restrictive, but, um, I think that was the city of Santa Cruz or the county of Santa Cruz did that. So I, I just provided some examples, sort of, a, you know, the, the state's page is way out of date. They're supposed to be doing these guidelines and um, public workshops, and they really have not been doing that. Uh, and I gave you some examples. It sort of goes from Truckee was, had this big complicated process. Um, City of St. Helena is kind of the bare minimum where it just referred to the state ordinance. Um, Pasadena was a little bit middle of the road. Um, Davis, I kind of liked their, their forms. Kind of seemed like a little bit more public friendly, user friendly process. Uh, so there's some examples. Um, also, like I said, water use. Um, so this, this LEAP grant task is, um, not just this landscaping ordinance, but also bringing water use into the permitting procedures. And, you know, that's, I have found a lot, surprisingly, I have found a lot of examples of communities that really, at, at least not residential water use. Um, 
or it's just the, if the size of the meter is, you know, which, and I, so I have a list of questions for the Coastal Commission for our next meeting on the 28th to ask them a little, some of these questions about, because increased water use is development of the Coastal Act. So I assume they've, I know the, the town of Mendocino has some pretty strict um, requirements because they have very limited groundwater supply. They're all wells. They're, they're opposite of Trinidad where they're all in wells, but they have a sewer system. Um, so yeah, so I, it's, um, I have been compiling water data for the last 10 years, water use data, I kind of look at trends, um, but you know, if, if a business all of a sudden increase their water use, I think that's something, you know, that affects the septic system, it affects the city's water supply. I think those are things that we should at least be aware of and, you know, uh, potentially, you know, people have to submit a, an application for a new use or a new water hookup, and then there's some sort of contract that you know, if your water use is within this much, you're fine, but if you go over that amount, then so that's kind of what I had in mind. That's what this task is about. So, um, so this is kind of just an introductory item. Get some questions, comments. We're gonna we're gonna keep working on it over the next few. Okay, thank you. Questions for staff from the commission. Um, as are you aware Humboldt County has adopted such below um, as part of their ordinances or something like that, especially given that we're providing water to the city? So the city, uh, I know the city of Eureka has some provisions. I think as far as I know, the county would just refer to the state as much as far as I know. Um, that's, that is, you bring up a good point. Um, so I have for a lot of, for the drought contingency plan and some of the other water things we've been working on, I've used the city of Santa Cruz as, as a model. Um, and they, they regulate the, the users that are connected to their system that are outside the city are subject to their water work. So I think we need to make sure that that's the case um, for the people within the city's water. They're hooked up to the city's water system. So we need to look at that ordinance. So that, I think the city's water ordinance was 1971. It, it, it does have a lot of good stuff in there, you know, and I'm comparing it to other ordinances, but again, I'm sure 1971, there's some things updated. Yeah, so I think, and you know, people outside the city aren't going to like that, but I think it's the city's water. That's a little very limited one. Okay. Sorry, Aaron, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I think my internet's cutting in and out. Um, one, Trevor, I just wanted to say I really, really, really like the slow chart that you adapted from the city of Vallejo. And I would love to see that kind of format for a lot of like the FAQ section. I know we've talked a lot about that over the short time I've been on the planning commission, just when there's, this is a really easy way for someone to understand what does or doesn't require contact permits, that kind of stuff. So anyway, I just really like that, that you found and, and adapted. Um, and then I just kind of had an overall question. Um, I, I recognize that this is all for landscaping going forward with new projects or you know, something that falls in the guidelines of, of a project between 500 and 2,500 square feet. Um, have you seen anywhere as you've been poking around funding research, uh, you know, sources for uh, replacement programs for um, turf going to a seasonal turf product? That's you know, I have quasi turf collection of weeds masquerading as a lawn on my property. Um, but it goes dormant. It's not irrigated. And there are a few parcels in town that have irrigated you know, it, it, is there funding basically to say, hey, if you switch this to a water efficient turf or replacement or something, I don't know if you've encountered that because I think that would be something that would dovetail nicely with this ordinance in concept anyway. I have seen that in other jurisdictions. I will look into 
those funding sources. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, uh, going to the, since we were talking about the flow chart, I guess I was initially a little bit confused just by the first question. It sort of sounded like 500 square feet of new construction. I was thinking, like, is that a 500 square foot building or is it I later sort of figured out it's just the landscape? I have that question too. On some, some of the ordinances, our language wasn't clear, but Pretty sure it's landscape. Uh, well, after I looked at some of the other ones, it seems like it's just the landscape, yeah. but it is a little yeah. unclear there. Um, and then, and then I was looking at the one from Davis, and it, they made it sound like you only, if you were only proposing like an irrigated landscape, then you were. Versus if you're like. Say like, you know, if you want a landscape, but you're not proposing any sort of irrigation system, then like, do you need, does this apply? I mean, especially around here, we're like, you really barely irrigate unless you're like growing a really nice lawn or vegetables. Yeah, that, that's a good point. And I did see that as an exemption in a number of ordinances. If it's not, and I don't know if it's clear exemption in the state ordinance, but I did see it in some other ordinances. If it's not irrigated landscaping, it would be exempt. Because I think this is really about water use. That makes a lot of sense. And then I, I don't really know what like the prescriptive worksheet looks like, but or how intensive that is for the applicant to fill out. But and I guess we would come up with that. But I, is there some kind of the, like processing fee that comes along with that, I assume, or like, how much of a hindrance is this to it? That's probably I don't know what the costs are. The the um David did have a prescriptive sheet. Some of these links do have and it's a one page form and it's you have to just figure out your areas and you know there's a requirement to add a certain amount of mulch per square feet. Um and it's, it's a one-page form that I think a landowner could do. Um, outside of the prescriptive process, it does require it. Uh, yeah, just a, a couple of comments. Um, I, <laughs> in some ways, um, this really will require some very specific definitions um, and I know we always have to worry about that, but in this case, uh, as I started through, the first thing that comes to mind is what does irrigation mean? I mean, if I take a water hose and go out and water my little plant, am I irrigating? And um, goes to your point uh, in that, you know, is that part of the system that, that would then drive us to do more like the prescriptive uh, process uh, versus nothing at all. You know, I, so it, it, it just smacks of needing some very specific uh, language. Um, the, the other thing is um, Yeah, I mean, what is rehabilitated landscape? I mean, um, if I go out and pull some weeds, is that rehabilitating the landscape? I mean, I realize that this is way in. <laughs> I realize that we are in the weeds when I say this, uh, but uh, you know, it, and and we'll get into this in more detail. I don't want to, but it's just like this just screams of needing some really specific definitions and and this the state well has a long list of them yeah i saw some of those yeah <laughs> right um yeah i mean it's i think the ordinance i you know, was like it's longer than the city's entire stuff <laughs> yeah um and and yeah i think you're right that there are most of our projects will be less than the uh, 
500 square feet, certainly not larger than the 2,500 square feet. Uh, but there are some, and one of the examples I was thinking of with the horse pasture, um, that's in some places irrigated. <laughs> and, and so, you know, that's where all the, the definitions and specifics get, get kind of uh, dicey. Um, uh, and I think there's an exemption for ag. Uh, is there? I didn't. Yeah, at least in some of the ordinance I saw, okay. I saw I there's I'll definitely see. an exemption for yeah, That would be great. Ag. Not, but that land is its own for ag, so how do you define it? Yeah, that's. So just if it's so it's clear, the intent in the long term is to incorporate this uh, wellow into our general plan and incorporate that into some sort of ordinances and requirements for landscaping. So they're kind of meshed together and at some point will be com uh, uh, compatible with each other. Yeah, so at the next meeting, I hope to be able to bring back some suggestions for where to you know, start to add landscaping into the zoning ordinance. Um, you know, Traditionally, landscaping has been more of a, you know, landscaping is required under these circumstances. So yeah, there's a, I think a little bit of that for parking lots. Um, um, this goes beyond that in, in terms of you know, residential landscaping and, you know, we we get you know new projects and we don't get the landscaping program that goes with it and I think I mean both with view issues and water issues I think it is something that's worth reviewing. Um, there are some properties that use this this climate is you know certain plants are going to salt the wind sandy soil, need a lot of irrigation. So I think it is something that's worth looking at. So so yeah, the next meeting, I plan on bringing some, some language back and some suggestions as to where we could start to fit this in. And then the question becomes, how much do we want, does the city want its own ordinance and regulations versus how much do we just, oh, landscaping of 500 to 2,500 feet, see this section of the state code. It could be as simple as that. And that's, that would be the next. Okay. Here. Your hand is up. Are you frozen? Hang on. Uh, am I back now? Yes. Okay. Sorry. I'll relocate here. Uh, just relative to the comment about the, um, your comment, Richard, and, and Tristan's point as well, I think it's important that we think through uh, down the road, somehow defining whether or not you're tied to city irrigation or city water, municipal water versus catchment or gray water systems or that type of stuff. That'll be a detail we'll want to sort out. I just want to kind of get that out there to put in the parking lot, so to speak. Good point. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, the other, I guess my other thought on this is like, in my mind, 2,500 square feet really, I mean, I don't really know what def what landscaping is, but 2,500 square feet really isn't that big. And like anyone in the rural residential with a half acre lot could easily come up with 2,500 square feet of landscaping, which if that means you have to, hire a landscape architect to do all these complex analysis. I mean, maybe that's one thing if you want to put in a really nice turf field, but I think if you're just trying to have some landscaping that grows without irrigation and whatnot, I mean, I pretty sort of brought this up, but <clears throat> um, if you're not proposing in a lot of Irrigated irrigation in your overall plan, like I feel like there there definitely should be some exemption here. I mean, that could be like like twenty five hundred square feet is like someone's septic system. You know, the leach you'll 
have to do something done to that. Like, I hate to have to go through this whole thing just to figure out. How to deal. So, just another thing. I, I agree. I think we should make sure that um, I will look at some of these definitions. Um, but yeah, I think if it's not irrigated or if it, even if it has to be irrigated for the first year or two, and then it's not irrigated after that, it shouldn't, shouldn't be part of this. I think we have to think about what we want to, like with the, we want people to be storm rainwater catchment, then we have to show them how to do it and show them a method that they can then buy into or want for them. And then we try to incentivize that. So I think, I mean, I've been looking for different systems and if anybody has any ideas, I think if we just put something up, others may want it also. Well, we're working on something, right? Yeah, so um, <laughs> the, the stormwater grant originally included a rainwater catchment demonstration they took it out, they thought they were going to run out of money. It turns out they ended up with enough money. Um, so they are going to move forward with a, I don't know, five to 10,000 gallon rainwater catchment um, on the, at the school under the bus, the catchment from the bus roof, bus shed roof to water their garden there at the school. Um, and then the other thing we've talked about, and I mentioned that um, I'm wanting to include in the grant is, so if you're, if a tank is under 5,000 5, gallons, it doesn't need engineering. It doesn't need a foundation unless you're on an unstable slope or, you know, there are some exceptions to that. Uh, and then anything over 5,000 square feet or 5,000 gallons requires an engineered foundation and secure systems, but we could have some pre-approved plans. So an engineered concrete slab with the earthquake straps or whatever is required. And as long as you have someone follow that, then you're pre-approved. You don't have to go through process and hire an engineer. That would be one thing we've talked about doing that would help. Yeah, I think it could really define Trinidad, kind of like Mendocino does, that they have to do it. But it could really be a good thing. And it could be a good sales pitch for the city of Trinidad. I, I agree. And I'm wondering, <clears throat> is that within the scope of a wheel? Um, the rainwater attachment? Yeah. It could, uh, you know, I think at the, uh, at least as, uh, uh, at least as effective, effective. Yeah. Um, yeah, it gives you room to, you know, again, you can incentivize it if it's watered by rainwater catchment or, or gray water, then it's exempt. You know, you could do that as, as a simple incentive. Yeah. I'm fully in support of something like that. My understanding of the of the Trinidad water situation is that there's plenty of supply until there's not, right? That there would be nice for the periods where there's not supply to rely on. Exactly. Sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. Any other comments? Uh, I will open it up for any public comment at this point. And hearing or seeing none. I'll bring it back to the commission and sounds like we'll see more of this in the future. Yeah, and if you think of, you know, I, I know this is a lot to look through um, the ordinance itself as a slog. Um, so as you continue to look at this stuff, feel free to email me questions. Hopefully you have the answers. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, our next agenda item, uh, number four, general plan, zoning update, community design discussion decision on an updated draft of the community design element and design criteria. This is continued from our last meeting in January. 
Uh, you want to just bring us up to speed, Trevor? Yeah, I don't have much to report. I just uh, made the changes from what we discussed at the last meeting. I uh, I took the comments out because most of the comments were for my reference at this point. So now you can see it full size. Um, and yeah, there weren't a lot of changes at the last meeting. So yeah, if you're happy with it, um, we can pass it along to, to the city council. And then in terms of the guidelines, you know, I have a, an inquiry into the Coastal Commission as to how to deal with the private versus public views. I think that's the main question we need to answer before we try to do an LCD amendment to change these guidelines. Um, and... And it's probably, we have a whole series of amendments that we've been working on, so we um, it'll have to get in line. But we've also talked about potential ways to implement these for the LCP amendments. That might take some time. So I think Misha wants to move on to talk about that next. Okay. Um, questions, comments, or staff from the commissioners? I think I have to go through this page by page again? Or? I, I think we can go. I think that would make sense. Uh, there's, uh, I have at least one or two com comments. I think it would go pretty quick. In general, if there's anything that uh, we want to just ask. Yeah, except, except, except I've got a quick question, which is, um, I know that's, during the joint meeting of the planning commission, the city council of the STR committee, there was, um, you know, there was uh, some some interest in revisiting the issue of undergrounding utility, for example, right? And I'm wondering if looking on page four, CU two point six, if we got rid of text like new or relocated electric and communication distribution lines, just left it. You know, preserving and enhancing deep borders by underground and or screening electric communication distribution lines, period, right? Would that be in any way supportive or would it in any way facilitate uh, the council or whoever else's efforts to get undergrounding completed? Yes, I think we have to. I think the issue is, you know, in some places I've seen it drive, it would be pretty expensive and, and, and even difficult to underground some of the lines in geologically unstable areas, for example. Um, so in terms of requiring it, but I think you could add to this policy that says whenever funding is available underground, assume. Oh, let me... Chris, let me make sure I understand where you're referencing. Yeah, we'll so get to it, but hack at page 42, which is page four document itself. And CD 2.6 um, specifically mentions new or relocated oh. electric okay. communication distribution lines. I'm wondering if there would be any consequence of just removing new or relocated um, to essentially make the above ground lines in the city limits. Legal is the right word, but certainly against what's presented here. Yeah, I, I and and this is also uh, part of the uh, uh, design review criteria on page six, and I did have some questions on that just that that paragraph as well. Um, specifically. Um, I get the fact that uh, when it's the only alternative, they should follow the least visible route, be well-designed, simple, and unobtrusive. But I don't know. I don't know how you deal with a minimum of bulk and make use of compatible colors and materials. Somebody's going to paint paint poles or paint hardware. It, it just seems to me that's kind of an extraneous requirement. Which one's that? Uh, it's on page... 51 of the packet, um, uh, Yes. paragraph I, utilities. And I believe that's an existing, that's existing language. Really? Yeah. Okay. I want to see all the poles painted. 
And, okay, well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, I've never, I mean, never seen a telephone pole look like a tree. Like they do with cell towers. So I, no, I, that is... Uh, I would I would say taking out the have a minimum bulk and make use of compatible colors and materials is just take that out. Yeah, I, I just didn't see that uh, that made any real sense. And the new metal ones look pretty stout, but I don't see, think we're going to be getting new metal poles that's for fire. You know. I, I don't think that's an app around here. No, if they're going to spend that kind of money, they might as well underground it. I did have just one clarification in your staff report. Um, about midway through the paragraph there, it says, therefore, one option would be to keep the regulations fairly general and adopt a more detailed policy later that can be amended more easily because it would not have to go through the Coastal Commission. I, I, are, are you referring to story polls there? Just the story polls. Oh, yeah. That's what I was trying yeah. to make sure I understood. Okay. I think that it itself. Um, I mean, you do see examples of you know, uh, Carmel is kind of the classic like, 50 page design review manual that they have. It's outside the regulations. But I think, I think. Yeah, keeping it at this level that we have it as is fine to have it in regulations and then it's more the fundamental. But yeah, I was thinking the story polls because we were starting to talk about the netting and the flagging and getting into those kind of details about um, you know, sample figures. And, and so I think some of those kind of details, you know, we could have a policy or a guidance document that could be a public handout that kind of gets more detailed and that doesn't. Okay. Any other general comments, questions before we plow through these two documents? Well, yeah, just following up with the, the story poll suggestion. I mean, are you sort of thinking like story polls maybe for these specific rules? policies regarding story polls doesn't really belong here because it doesn't actually have to do with the design of a structure. No, I think you can have these story poll rated. No, I, I mean, I think at a minimum, you should say story polls are required. I mean, and then you can have everything else as guidance. Um, or I think, you know, having some, having the regulations as they are, I think it's fine too. I, don't, I just don't think, I don't know that we need to get any more detail than they already are. I just want to revisit my question uh, once more because I'm relatively new to all of this. So, um, again, that question was sort of addressing whether enacting, say, the community law, for example, uh, if that's all satisfactory, so existing development can take place. But, I'm sorry. Um, just it was in the question was answered is good it has to worry. <laughs> but uh, once the community design element is enacted, does that is there any sort of retroactive changes that can be compelled? You know, like no. so if we talk about like going back to the example of, uh, of underground, this is an example, if suddenly the community design element says that the utility lines must be underground, does that compel any action, say the part of PGD or the city or county? They say, well, the, the telephone poles predated um, this you know, design. How does that work? Good question. Um, normally, things are grandfathered. Um, so, if you, but there are ways to make things retroactive. It just, um, there are some legal limitations that we'd have to be careful about how we do that. Um, the other thing we, we try and be careful of is. Yes, it would be great to underground all the lines in, in Trinidad Underwood, for example, um, and Erie Road, um, but it is really expensive. Um, so you don't want to commit the city to doing something. You know, it's so we always use words like if feasible or if funding is available. It's like that. 
Um, and, and so like a policy can certainly say underground existing lines were infeasible. And certainly, and that's retroactive, but it's it sort of lets the city look and be careful about you know committing the city to, to too much. Thank you. Okay, so shall we just uh, walk through these in our customary manner of one page at a time? Starting off with the design, sorry, the community design element, page one. Any comments, corrections? I move pretty fast through it since we've already looked at this several times. So stop me when you feel you want to. Page two, page three, page four, page five, page six, page seven. Uh, page seven. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, CD 7.1 on the second line, including maximized use of recycled materials and recycling, comma, energy efficiency. Should we just delete the and recycling? Or is that, what is that? Not sure why that. Second recycling would be is just a thought. Is it because part of LEED certification and those types of things necessitate having recycling in the building? Could that be what it came from? I know when we built a fire station that got certified, we had to have recycling bins in certain places, and they came through and counted them, so to speak. That's the only thing I can think of, um, but it, it's kind of awkward. Though. It seems, yeah, I'm not sure we can. I'm not sure we want to regulate people's recycling bins. At least not on a residential level. No, and if they go after LEED certification, that'll happen automatically, right? Automatically. So we can encourage it. But it's awkwardly written anyway. Energy efficiency. But energy efficiency is in that choice. What about just removing and recycling? Does that yeah. make it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because this list could go on and on in terms of we bicycle friendly, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So. And we could strike the second energy efficiency. Yes. Case. Okay. All right. Can we turn to you, page six for just a second? Sure. Uh, when vegetation is mentioned, um, following up on that reload conversation, I'd like to add exemptions for edible plants as well. That's acceptable. For under which like, one? Like 6.1, for example, we landscape each other, like native, drought tolerant, uh, and or edible plants, right? Like I'd like to introduce more edible plants. I guess edible, but also not agricultural. Like edible, but not... You know, yeah, like, well, there's those food garden. That's still there, a little mini garden. Please. So, uh, yeah, the only reason I didn't make a comment there, uh, I, that's, that's a good comment, but uh, uh, the program here, again, another program, but it was to adopt a water efficiency landscape standards and or an ordinance in accordance with the Department of Water Resources. I thought that that would be the Wellow. Yes, yes. Okay, so in the Wellow would uh, define any exemptions. Okay, but I think, you know, it does think a new Either landscaping yeah. shall, um, you know, and whether you have controlling non invasive landscaping. If you want, you know, we can add edible landscaping to the list, or you can add it at the end, edible landscaping is also acceptable. So it's sort of maybe on a lower level. How, I, you know, I think either way it would be appropriate. I mean, I certainly support including it in there. It's, 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 this type of thing appears in several places, right? Mm -hmm. Native job calling plants, uh, with anything edible to all of those instances. Um, the other thought I had regarding that same uh, phrase is whether there are, there's plenty of native plants that aren't drought tolerant, right? That virtue of this living in this ecosystem. 
we don't know exactly how drought tolerance is defined, right? But we have to have a bunch of burns. Well, it depends on how you define native and how large of an area um, <laughs> that includes. Um, but certainly, I mean, things that are native to the Trinidad area should be able to survive a summer without water. So should be the definition of drought tolerance. Yeah, I, mean, I know what you're saying, like skunk cabbage, right? It's got to have people. <laughs> So, you're just like, so yeah, that's okay, me. Yeah, okay, there's, plenty of, there's plenty of plants. Like I'm thinking about plants. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Is drought is relative, right? Drought here is completely different from sure. drought on the central coast, for example, right? So I mean, I guess I am curious about the validity of that phrase, native drought tolerant plants. But I think again, there's probably plenty of native plants which aren't. Well, I think so. I think it's native. Or drought to or drought tolerant or edible and non invasive, you know. So I think those are all separate things in there. Um, is that in our glossary? Edible and drought tolerant. Yes. Uh, I. I mean, I if there's know. if there's some if there's some question about the you know what what they are, maybe we should add them. I hate to say it, but it, does it have to be human edible? I just had a quick question on that kind of the concept of vegetable gardens versus landscaping. And it's the fastest way back to the drift, but it's quite a swim. Um, <laughs> uh, just you know, the, the sorry, I got distracted by the quite a swim uh, we were listening to. But uh, you know, the the concept of a vegetable garden, um, you know, just playing this out. Are people going to plant fruit trees in an you know in an effort to skirt something? And now we're going to have uh, an abundance of I, I don't know. Just just kind of thinking that through, and, and I don't know. Is, is a vegetable garden considered landscaping? I guess kind of is the question that's popping into my brain right now as we're having this discussion. I certainly think they should not be. You know, it's kind of a separate category, um, almost from this. Yes, I mean, I think yes, I think an edible garden is part of landscaping now. But if it's not, but you know, it might be exempt from the wellow, but maybe it's not exempt from design review. So you know, you can plant a cherry tree and irrigate it, but you can't, you, you still can't plant it to, so that it'll grow up and block someone's view. So those can be two separate issues. You could say like edible orbs and bushes, right? I would exclude trees if that was one of the concerns, right? Yeah, I think, I mean, you could, but I mean, I think, I mean, you can keep yeah, certain trees pretty small. So uh, I, I've lost the thread. Uh, do we have a, a, an agreement on what we're going to say here? I think we're starting to overlap. So I'm going to add edible to this list. And we've already got some policies that say landscaping is not going to block the use. So I think that's covered. And what I need to look at is a glossary. Is the thing. Okay. Agree? I wonder about on page seven, where it says that um, Trinidad's beauty and character and other design policies, and then clear at the bottom it says to respect the cultural heritage of Trinidad. I mean, should not be further up or even not in with this other stuff that we kind of want, or it should be at least the first thing. Sure. Yeah, we can move seven point four to seven point one. We did that with the design criteria. We made it. Good, yeah. And I think it's in, let's see, it's, it's probably also in. Yeah, so it is in 1.3a. So we can make seven. It seems like an afterthought clear at the bottom there. Yep, I agree. Okay, any other questions, comments? 
Um, I think I'll wait for public comment until we go through the procedures, the design review procedures, and then we can all lump them together. So quite a bit of overlap. So, okay, moving through um, chapter 17.60. Any questions, comments on page one? Um, I had a question on page one. Maybe we've gone over this, but I can't remember the answer. So design review in the context of the new ADU ordinance, would an ADU go through design review? Good question. Uh, it depends. So, uh, so you can carve an ADU out of an existing space for one, and that wouldn't require design review. Um, and then there's also, um, so there's a current exemption for accessory structures less than 500 square feet and less than 15 feet in height. Um, and so there's a similar exemption that we included in the ADU ordinance, at least it's currently written. Now it's, it's going to get re revised and come back to you. Um, and I think I made it 16 feet because I've been at 16 feet. A bit more standard than 15 feet, um, and and that includes an addition. So you can add on to your house to make an ADU if it's over 16 feet, though it has to go through design review. Now it's not saying that 16 feet can't impact people's views, and you know that. But I think the exemption is going to. It, it looks like the exemption is going to primarily be in areas that are not appealable. So one of the things I'm talking to the Coastal Commission about is a lot of a lot of things that they allow exemptions for are they don't allow the exemptions in the areas that are appealable. And there's actually not a lot of truth. Because it's within between the first public road and the sea. And I'm I'm gonna see if I can make an argument that that is Underwood, but Underwood doesn't, it's a dead end technically, even though it runs right into that state park road. Um, but it seems like the school, that central area really should be. But anyway, it's a 300 feet from a bluff, 100 feet from a creek, between the sea and the first public road. It's, it's a very narrow part of, even up Berry Road, there's some, but there's creeks, so, um, there's very little of Trinidad that is out outside the appealable area. And so that's the only place those exceptions are going to apply. And then those aren't really few areas. Anymore. Okay. Moving on then to uh, the design review chapter. And we were on page one. That was a question. Page two. Um, yeah, I have another question on page two under letter G under the story polls. I guess I was just curious, like if you have some examples when you as the administrator, Trevor, would find it practical or unnecessary. Yeah, if someone were adding a roof on the porch in the back of their house, maybe. Now, we're also talking about not having design review for something small or an administrative permit process. Um, you know, if, if someone were going to add on to the entryway to their business, sorry, goals might interfere with the entryway to the business potentially. Um, no, I mean, I haven't thought that far. Um, it seems like it might be a good idea to have an exemption, but we are going to have an administrative permit process. Maybe that's exception enough. Well, if I, I don't mind not having to make that. <laughs> if we are incorporating Willow into our design review process, I could certainly see where someone is changing their landscape would not require story posts. It was fe it could be feasible that we would not need story posts for for low level landscaping. Right, right. So I, I think I think 
you know, it might be kind of a very general statement, but I think there may be some situations where we we would need this. Yeah. And really, you know, I think it's it would be something that, um, and, and, you know, maybe we can add some language here the Planning Commission can request. So, you know, like it is right now, story pools aren't a requirement, but I tell people, Planning Commission is not going to approve your project unless you put story pools on first. So it could be something like that where I say, well, I don't think you need story pools, but it's at your own risk the Planning Commission might request it. Yeah, I guess I'd sort of ask that because I've been thinking of story poles in the context of coastal views. Like, and like, if there aren't coastal views at stake, obviously, like in my neighborhood, is that something that's still, I guess, but that would, like, does the Planning Commission, I guess I'll put it to the Planning Commission, does the Planning Commission feel like that is still something we want? when coastal views aren't at stake. I mean, that's what has always been contentious in the city of Trinidad is when there are coastal views at stake. But if someone wants to build a house or something, but they're just a blocking, I just think, like your neighbor's house, you know, it's, is that, do we need to have story for that? I think the other incense, the other primary incense would be the bulk. So, you know, a house, you know, across the freeway or wherever on scenic might not have the potential to block people's views, but it might present just this bulky thing from the street. That would be the other instance. Or, some, you know, sunlight, I think, is also a, you know, how a neighbor might, might not know how it would affect their the sunlight. Of course, that changes the season. So, what's an error? Yeah, just uh, I was just gonna kind of weigh in, and then I had something on G as well. But uh, I would say story polls. I, I I hear your point, Tristan, but I think there's also a need sometimes with residential for kind of to Trevor's point about the bulk and that kind of stuff because it's not just the coastal views. I have no coastal views for my property either, but. I could see somebody building something adjacent to me or changing the profile of the bulk that I would, you know, that would, I would find that helpful. Um, but then and also under G Trevor, uh, my question on this that I had was in, in a circumstance where you would waive or modify the requirements, would that naturally be in your uh, staff report? One, I would hope that it would, and I don't know if we want to kind of capture that in writing. So that way someday when there's not Trevor, and we've got a new city planner, you know, hey, if these are modified, it would be part of the staff report. And then I didn't know if it would make sense to somehow pre-notice or if we could even legally do it pre-notice the planning commission. Hey, this one's going to come before you. I've waived it because of this. That way the applicant doesn't go through the headache of coming before us and then us simply turning and saying, neat, we'd like you to come back again and show us it with story polls. I, I, and again, I don't know if we can even do that legally. Those are kind of my two thoughts. I mean, I don't see, you know, if this, so I'm, I'm going to add some language the Planning Commission can still request story polls, and I guess you wouldn't know until the staff report comes out. I have to think about that, I guess. We'll hold that over how that might work. Um, and it could be something that's included in the public notice. Story polls will be placed or aren't placed. It could be part of the public notice. I don't know that that needs to be in the regulations, but we could add that to our public notice and then it should carry on forward. Okay. Okay. So there may be still some work we need to do on this paragraph. I think I'm hearing right. But I'm going to add that the plan, um, some language the planning commission can still request it if it's waived. I think we can figure out the exact procedural details outside the regulations. Okay. Anything else on page two? 
page three. Page four. Um, under architectural styles and features, number seven, I think you were, there's solar panels that comply with, I think we were, you were going to research something. That, yeah, so that's my note that um, it's basically the Solar Rights Act, okay. um, but we, that's another thing we need to incorporate into our regulations, but, but I, think, you know, I think for the most part, we can't require design review for solar panels. Um, so yeah, so that's one of the notes that I erased from this sure. so that we should look at that section. Also under D2 uh, for preset architectural styles. Um, this is the second time that standard fast food restaurant designs has appeared. I'm wondering if there is perhaps a more uh, relevant example we might include here, like, you know. Or just franchise, maybe. Like yeah, franchise. should it apply to residential homes as well in this instance or no? Like, is it, is it serving to, like, prevent direction of, like, a mission-style tract home type of thing? I mean, no, I don't think that's the idea. I think the idea is, you know, actually to keep Chevron Station out. I think that, you know, that was a missed opportunity. The city was desperate to get a gas station back. When it, it, there was a gas station there, it left. I can't. You know, we're not we're not gonna make you do something unique and to solve. We'll just let you do your franchise. Um so yeah, so I think it's really just sort of that franchise, standard franchise to some I think the track home would come out in the other. Yeah, I, I remember the the place someone bought the or wanted to buy the place next to the bed and breakfast, and they came out with this like Oh, I mean, it like these Greek columns, and oh, it was, but that was their dream home. And that's luckily they didn't end up finding out the videos. It's not an appropriate spot. <laughs> Scott, so I've got another thought or question that may or may not be applicable, but um, I think in other parts of California, like modular ABUs are becoming popular. But, like, ABUs are just being prefabricated and dropped in the backyards. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if. That would apply here as well. Like, would this preclude the placement of modular in the units? Except the intense. Or a box of their own. Yeah. Well, that's a good point. I think, I mean, I think modular homes can be nice, I mean, especially if they have architectural features added. Uh, what about preset commercial architectural styles? But they probably still bought that design. Um, because, you know, the, the unique home styles is kind of covered under D1, I feel. And two is kind of more for commercial, I feel. Well, maybe it's commercial franchise designs will be avoided. Just leave it, you know. That cover it? Yeah, that's fine, but I was just sort of curious about the intent of that particular part. Again, that's actually another one that's existing. Okay. Um, some legacy <laughs> language there that, yeah, in 1976. So let's see, so commercial franchise. Okay, um, anything else on page uh, four? Page five. Page six. Hey, sorry, I think I was actually kind of waiting for, uh, for Aaron to say something, but I know that we've been troubled by that that 2,000 square foot uh, regulation that often goes. Oh, you're going on page, page five? I am on page five. Yeah, okay. uh, E1A. <laughs> We, we had some questions previously about whether that was arbitrary. I, mean, I guess my opinion is that I would rather have um, like a pragmatic or practical square foot regulation that actually gets 
you know, observed rather than some arbitrary uh, square footage limit like that. Yes, observed. Yeah, so I'm just I'm just wondering whether that 2,000 square foot limit is appropriate in terms of what goes on. Uh, it's like I really like to see like you know a histogram, or I'd like to see you know what percentage of, of homes in town are actually at or below or above 2,000 square feet, and I'd also see you know some of those other sort of. I have actually put some of that information together for past projects. Um, it's not citywide, but neighborhood. Um, I actually recently did some for Underwood. Um, and it, it varies a lot. So I, I, I guess I'm still a little confused. Um, this, you know, they, they shall be considered out of scale with the community. Uh, unless they are designed and situated in such a way that their bulk is not obtrusive and the building is consistent with other design standards. Is, are, are you asking to crisp up the, the, the requirement for 2,000 square feet or adjust it? I'm not sure what. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I think, and Aaron, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but we've, we've sort of discussed this in the past and um, like thinking about the Vanderpool project, for example, which would have brought it over 2,000 square feet. Travis, yeah, we've sort of overlooked that particular element and focused instead on the on these other ratios, right? So I'm just wondering, like, whether we should have this toothless square foot limit, or whether it might be worth our while to actually have an enforceable, more applicable and rational square foot limit. Because 2000, I think I asked last meeting, like, where that 2000 value came from, so those 70s or something, right? So yeah, I mean, and I think it's. I mean, it's it's worked okay for Trivia. I was thinking one option could be, you know, 2,000 square feet shall be considered out of scale of the community, blah, blah, blah. But in no case will it exceed 25% or 10%. That might be a, a compromise. We put a hard, hard limit on. Am I missing something or isn't that already in there? It's 2,000 square feet and or. A floor area ratio, but that already is a hard limit of the twenty five percent. So the the ratio is is not in the existing guidelines or regulations. We we use that because two thousand square feet on an eight thousand square foot lot is twenty five percent. So we we use that as a guideline so that larger houses on larger lots are appropriate, smaller houses on smaller lots are appropriate. So we kind of use that. So maybe 2,000, so I was saying maybe that could be the hard one. But then that means, that means on a smaller lot, you're, you're putting a hard limit less than 2,000 square feet. That might be appropriate, right? That might be appropriate. I just... I mean, I, I was just going to say, I, I feel like what we have here, I, I agree. I have a margin note here just that we need to kind of suss it out in the future. Um, you know, this issue has come up a couple of times, but I personally, speaking for me, I feel like that what we have in place works reasonably well. I agree it's not uh, definitive by any, by any measure, but I mean, I can think of a project that as a commissioner, I've approved that was over the 2000 uh, that was out of, you know, be, because it was designed in such a way. And I can also think of one specifically where that was one of the findings that made me not want to approve the project in a combination with other findings. So um, I, I don't know, personally speaking, I feel like the language here works for now. I, I would be interested in, you know, some data analysis to see what, what, you know, what, what would it look like average square foot, you know, for the average lot size in Trinidad? We don't have a whole lot of parcels. It would just be some time for someone to go through and do that and do some simple math that a, a spreadsheet could do um, once the data was entered. Um, I don't know. So I guess I'm comfortable with it as it is with kind of the, the parking lot notion to it, it needs maybe some more work down the road. But there's also not a whole lot of opportunities, I think, for this to be that big an issue um, necessarily.
So where do we want to go with this? Um, do you want to, as you pointed out, just put it in the parking lot for the time being? Uh, I've, I, I have looked at this any number of times and I, I, I'm happy, but I, I can understand where people might be concerned. Um, I, I think what we've tried to do is to provide as much flexibility as possible at the same time, still stay within the boundary of some design, you know, criteria that makes some sense. Um, um, what's pleasure? Uh, I mean, I think I'm satisfied with the way it's written as well. Um, I think it's a good goal, but I, I'd like to leave some discretion there. I mean, I, we talked about this last meeting and I thought about it since then. Um, and I like that there is some discretion for bringing a project that does concrete. Free. No. So I'm good with it. That's it. Yeah, I feel like talking okay. about it. Okay. The the other thing we can do is when we make a recommendation to present this to the city council, we can say that may be an area you want to take a look at yourself and, you know, provide this is where we think it should be. But at the same time, if the city council feels strongly one way or the other, then uh, we can take that on, uh, under consideration as well. I mean, I don't have opposition to it per se. I was just sort of in search of the rationale for that particular value. And, and, and it just, just seems a bit arbitrary, but again, it also, yeah. uh, you, know, you got to choose some number, right? So. <laughs> Understand. Well, if, uh, if you think about it and you come up with some uh, other numbers that make some sense, uh, you know, we can, we can certainly <laughs> entertain it. Yeah. I, I do have some, some of that data. Um, and I could just shoot an email to you guys and see. It's like, I am uh, yeah, at risk of slowing the whole process on five, but just tasking the city council to, to look at that specific value. And, uh, to get that. I'll still send you the data. And <laughs> okay. At the city council level, you can maybe make some more suggestions. Okay. Anything else on page five? Page six. Um, paragraph I, uh, I think we've already discussed as part of the uh, ordinance. So uh, those similar changes that we will make, I assume. Okay. Page seven. Um, yeah, page seven, L2, um, the screening of. Uh, Various things. I, I definitely want to remove outdoor storage of materials from that. I don't know. I don't. I guess I don't see as outdoor storage of materials as a design feature. For one, um, and I guess I don't. My personal opinion. I don't really want to require screening of propane tanks. I, I think of them as just a feature of our quaint town and trying to hide, I mean, everyone has one and trying to hide them seems unnecessary. I get people want to do it, obviously. Page eight. And I don't think dumpsters counts as people's trash cans, Maybe a little hesitant requiring the screening of, of those too. Uh, I don't know if there's any other opinions on that. I guess my sort of my my mindset when I thought when I read that this time and thought of it, I, it just it makes it sound like we're trying to hide the fact that like people live here and they have stuff in their yard and they have their propane tank and trash cans and like that's just like life. And I don't necessarily think we need to like turn it, try to push this thing that like, oh, we need to hide all that shit. Yeah, and I think in the current general plan, you know, storage of crab pots is specifically protected. It's a <laughs> yeah. allowable use. Um, I, you know, I think this is primarily, 
geared towards commercial uses, so the commercial storage of materials um, and, and commercial dumpsters. If, if you want to add that. Um, if you want to make it convert, like add this commercial in front of all of that stuff, I guess. Could be. I mean, I will say for propane tanks, uh, I would. Before you remove, because that's been a requirement for a long time, and I think if, if everybody all of a sudden removes their propane tank screening, you might go. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but they're all they're almost all screen in town, and so you don't notice them, so you don't think that they are obtrusive. But if you could see them all, you might. I don't know. I I would think on that maybe a little bit more, because that has. I mean, that's, just because it's been. There's a it, it's there. been right. what Trinidad's done, so I would, you know, think about it before removing that. Um, right. But I think for commercial, I'm not against it. I'm not saying you shouldn't remove it. I'm just saying that I think you should think about it. Um, is all. And uh, but I think for everything else, we can definitely you know, have that just be. Covered. The duplex project over here, a couple of blocks over, they that that propane tank would be the only thing you'd see. Like it, it sits right there in the middle of everything. Yeah, they I built mean, a I, fence around. Well, you it, see it anyway. It flows. <laughs> yeah, but it flows now with the fence, and sure. you, you go past it and look at the house a little bit. But it just would stick out like a sore thumb, which is adds to character. Yeah, it becomes an old it's fishing village, and why not have a boat and an old propane tank sitting out in front of your yard? Right. I, don't, I, I think they did a good job of covering it. Okay. Yeah, the first thing that comes to mind is, um, and I don't know if we're covered somewhere. Maybe, maybe we have it. It's it's covered under nuisance abatement, uh, where someone is storing a whole bunch of stuff in their front yard or whatever. Um, uh, yes, there are. I realize it's not exactly. And that's what not even really explained to you. And so that, and that's why it's a commercial. That's that's why that's really commercial is because a residence, you're not going to expect outdoor storage of significant right. number of materials permanently. It, so it would be permanent screening for, you know, uh, you know, there was that woodlot behind Murphy's for a while, and if that was official permitted use, they have to screen there. Um, but for residences, yes, there are some provisions for outdoor storage of like vehicles and equipment that is not allowed in front yards, I believe. Okay, so what we're suggesting then is uh, uh, making this for commercial. Yes, ex except potentially propane tanks. Yeah, I, I, I kind of, my personal feeling, we would screen propane tanks better off. <laughs> That's just me. <laughs> it, can be, it can be pretty simple. Yeah, no, I know. And, and I, then there I, was I, one on Edwards not too long ago where they moved it to their front yard, and it just was pretty wide open before they put the little fence around it. Yeah, the, 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 the key here, I think, is visible from a public roadway or trail. Um, and if you can convince people that it's not visible from a trail or road, then there's no requirement to sweep. Yeah, well, yeah, add the, the commercial part to the first, the first things. Thank you. Anything else on page seven? I just had a question kind of on the same topic um, for Trevor, maybe. If someone has a, a home business that has storage of materials, where does that, is that regulated differently? And I appreciate and completely understand and love the crab pot uh, exemption, obviously. Um, you know, it becomes what's in a, you know, that one's exempted, but why if I, you know, the first one that jumped to my mind is a pool cleaning business, but that's, of course, hazardous material storage. That's regulated differently. But I, I don't know, you know, and, and I, I don't know how I feel about that. I was just curious, is that covered elsewhere that you can think of? So there are provisions, I believe, in the home occupation 
regulations that says not, no outdoor storage of equipment for home occupations. So if you're running a business out of your home, you can't store the equipment outside. So not, not to nitpick this, but uh, let's say that the horse pasture stores hay outside to the tarp. Would, would you would require them to screen? Well, so this is part of design review. So it would have to be associated with some sort of development that needs approval. So True. I think okay. hay would okay. fall under that for this provision. No, but that, yeah, I'm, I'm way off track. Thank you. Yeah, got it. Yeah, I get, I mean, well, the outdoor storage materials really, I mean, is that really part of the design? I guess it is. For commercial, yeah, for yeah. commercial business, I can see that. Right. Anything else on this issue? Okay. Anything else on page seven? Okay. And do you just suggest adding something about edible plants once again? I'm sorry, under what? Uh, N2. Oh, yeah. Well, actually, uh, yeah. That, uh, plus, isn't this whole section going to have to be changed? Well, necessarily. Because if this is really more the design review, um, where that is for you know, irrigation systems and species of plants and making sure the soil is amended and things like that. And that you can't, you know, okay. you can only have a certain, you know, limits the area of high water use plants like lawns to a certain percentage of the landscaping. Anything else on page eight? Um, yeah, the top number five, with regard to retaining walls, I think just the requirement for them to be sign serviced, all those different things. I guess I I want to add something in there for like only somehow if it's like only if they're visible from like sure. a public street, but if it's like retaining wall behind your house, like who cares? Yeah. I, I think that's the intent, um, and it does say should. Um, okay. But it could be retaining walls visible from public streets and trails, yeah. like the other one. Anything else on page eight? Page nine. Okay, very good. Um, so at this point, I will open it up for public comment on this last agenda item. Are there any comments from the public? All right, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the commission. So at this point, um, it's, this is just me speaking, I guess, but at this point, I think we've gone through this pretty Thoroughly, there are a couple of issues which we discussed this evening. Um, but I would be comfortable, I think, to recommend that we present it to the city council and let them take their, let them have an opportunity to review it and also to have them consider some of the questions that we've raised this evening. Is that reasonable to everyone? Okay, uh, could I hear a motion? Yeah, I have a motion to accept it as, as we spoke this evening. You did. To the city council. Okay, I hear a second. Second. Okay. Boom, second. Any further discussion? Just to clarify, so, I mean, a lot of issues and questions have come up. And so I just want to make sure I capture the ones you want the council to specifically 
look at. You may want to paint. I mean, we've had a lot of discussions of various things. Uh, how, how structure size is definitely one one ounce of the important things that you sort of have. Us. And 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 when I when I say we're willing to send it all, I mean with the the changes that we yes. have discussed and agreed to this evening. Yes. So I think the main one is uh, building E sorry uh, E one A. Unless anybody else has any other ones that they would like. I mean we've made some changes like adding yeah. edible, uh, you know that sort of stuff. But I'm I'm happy with. I think we're going to change it as much as we change it tonight. Every time we look at it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there's always something. Yeah. There is a phrase about that, but I would say. Uh, okay, so we have a, a, a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Well, say aye. 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 Post. Motion carries. Um, so our recommendation is that we would like to hear from the council. Okay. Congratulations. Pardon me? That was big. It's a big one. Yes. That is a big it's... one. Yes. I it's been with us a while. I suspect we'll see it again, but uh, we'll see. Okay. Next item on our uh, agenda are commissioner's reports. Does, do any of the commissioners have any items that they'd like to report on? Aaron. Just briefly upcoming, we do have a water advisory committee meeting in a couple of days. So if there's anything uh, that you want me to look into, please ask. And I did want to share that I had the opportunity uh, to take a water treatment plant tour, and it was incredibly educational uh, to be there with uh, Phil. I, uh, his last name escapes me, uh, the current operator from Coleman Engineering, um, and, get, and hear his input and suggestions on where the city should be pursuing additional water storage. and. I definitely am going to make sure that that is connected back to the city council as they continue with their process with GHD and other folks. There's, I think, an opportunity to put a tank in the wrong place if we're not careful uh, and create some problems for the city in the future. So that's all. No, good to know. Yeah. And we have a trails committee next Tuesday. It was going to be Valentine's Day and it got bumped. Um, but any input is very much appreciated. And you're all welcome or whatever, you know. Um, and, or if you have anything, email me or whatever. Thank you. Thank you. More next time. Anything else? I'll just mention real quickly, just as a reminder to all of us that served last year, our Form 700s are due. I think April 1st, a little first. I will. Maybe you can check on that. It's well, I mean, we all received an email. I just forget it. Okay. My email is not up, but just a reminder that uh, four, seven, form 700s have to be filled out and submitted. And it can be electronically. Anything else? Uh, staff report. I don't think I need a report. I'm just. Uh... Doing on the same priorities that we talked about um, the summer meeting and then the joint. So, um, yeah, so we will continue, and I'm going to continue to work with the Coastal Commission to come up with a plan of action as getting these amendments through, through their certification process and strategizing how to do that as well as um, I sent them all the general plan elements so far again to comment. So, so yeah, so we're just going to continue working on these same things. So you'll see more landscaping and water related stuff coming forward. Um, working on the 80 ordinance again coming up. Anyway. Are you um, uh, pleased with the meetings with the Coastal Commission? We've only had two, and for the, <laughs> for the most part, 
I think they've been productive. What I was sort of realizing now is I'm not not necessarily getting the follow through. So, you know, there was a list of action items for them that they were going to follow up and get me answers. And maybe they just assumed they'd give me the answers at the next meeting. I was hoping to get them sooner so I could get working. I assume I'll get them at the next meeting. So we'll, I guess we'll see. Otherwise, I might see if I can keep those looking along. Yeah, they did just have their meeting. Um, they passed the an eight department to Humboldt County, so I'm going to take a look at that. Um, and then the lighthouse. So they approved. Yes. Then so they were they were all off. I think it will be helpful, but yeah. Great. Everybody. And next item uh, is uh, future agenda items. And this uh, is the same list that we've been covering for some time. Any changes or additions, deletions? Uh, again, being relatively new to this, I certainly in front of every <laughs> agenda that I've seen, or they've appeared as future agenda items on every agenda I've seen. I'm just sort of curious. If there's a known timeline uh, on which these will be addressed, you know, you've got all of these priorities. Yes, and I, one, um, I think that's the problem right now is that, uh, yeah, there's other more pressing priorities like grant, you know, getting the, the grant funding, but we don't want to forget about them. We don't want them to drop off the radar. Um, I am, some of these I'm, you know, we're kind of working on the, with the stormwater grant, we're working on rainwater catchment um, for. Uh, I'm, I'm working on a cultural resource element um, that will incorporate some of the management plan into the general plan. Um, I sent off a, a draft of that to the tribes, and uh, they said they'll be looking at it and get comments back. Actually, I have a meeting with the rancheria next month to talk about that. Um, although I, I left the management plan policies out for now, pending the, there's mediation coming up management team and so just gonna wait for that to play out this so he transfers the land obviously so in the background I'm working on some of these vegetation regulations we are I mean it's not the views of vegetation ordinance but we're gonna be working on landscaping regulations signage well design review that's a signage issue too so we are we are working Okay, any other final comments? All right, otherwise we are adjourned. Thank you. Recording stop.